But we're talking about dunya, and we're talking about the life of this world, and the transient nature of it, and how we're passing through it, and what expectations we should have of it, and so on and so forth. And as we venture into this topic, the word in and of itself of dunya represents its worth in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The word dunya, which means dunu or dani, which means that which is the lowest and that which is humiliated, is actually a great indication of where it stands in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and where it should stand in our sight. But the unique and interesting thing about it, you know, if you've studied world religion and if you've studied different paths and so on and so forth, what is absolutely stunning about Islam over and over and over again is its balance. What's stunning about the character of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is his balance. Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that if we wanted to find the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the first place we went to, where do you guys think it would be? The masjid. And if we did not find him in the masjid, he said, we went to the graveyard. And if we did not find him in the graveyard, we went to the marketplace. And the order of that, the, uh, of that list is quite telling in and of itself that you are more likely to find the Prophet ﷺ reflecting in the graveyard. That would be a likelier possibility if he was not in the masjid than to find him walking around in the marketplace. And subhanAllah, that in and of itself is not what makes this so fascinating. The remembrance of death, as the Prophet ﷺ tells us, to constantly remind ourselves of the destroyer of pleasures and so on and so forth. What makes this so incredible is that the Prophet ﷺ, despite visiting the graveyard as frequently as he did, despite encountering death within his own family as frequently as he did, despite his own disconnect from this dunya, that did not transpire in the Prophet ﷺ being a depressed individual. The Prophet ﷺ did not used to sulk. The Prophet ﷺ did not used to look sad. The Prophet ﷺ did not used to treat his family like he did not care about this world. He was able to find this balance وسلم, as were his companions to where they could shun materialism but still be as alive as anyone could imagine. They could still look lively. They could still be lively. They could still enjoy this world without at any point becoming heedless of their ultimate destination and their ultimate purpose. Because to attach yourself to death too much can lead to detrimental things if you don't have the balance of the Prophet ﷺ. It can lead to a person either losing motivation and no longer pursuing career goals and no longer pursuing greatness in, this, in the worldly sense. It could lead to a person always being sad and not being happy. And it could lead to a person at the end of the day just being completely idle and waiting around for their death. But the Prophet ﷺ did not live it in that sense, nor did his companions. They could still laugh, they could still smile, they could still share poetry with one another, they could still joke with one another. And he وسلم, was still always smiling and always in a, happy, in, in a happy demeanor so that he could inspire other people to also learn that this religion is not one that depresses a person. It's not one that puts you down. Now as for the value of dunya, and Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala in his elucidations in Miftah Dar al-Sa'adah where he speaks about the reality of this world, he says something very interesting. He says that the dunya knows its worth. The world knows its worth. And because the world knows its worth and knows that at some point it will be completely abandoned by each and every single person, it decorates itself and adorns itself hoping that it can delude a person as long as possible. So he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of this dunya already knows its worth. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, that if this world was to mean to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if it was to be in value to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, more than the wing of a mosquito, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not allow the one who rejects him to even have a sip of water. You think about that. These people that insult Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these people that insult the deen, these people that live completely immoral lives and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still allows them to be sustained from this dunya. And that shows you the worth of it in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet ﷺ made a direct equivalence, he drew a direct equivalence between the way Allah sees it and the way Allah allows it to benefit others and sustain others. 
If it's not worth anything to you, then you're not going to fight over it. You're not going to be possessive over it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He allows those people who reject Him, despite their rejection, to drink from it and to benefit from it. And in another hadith, which is very interesting, the Prophet said that on the Day of Judgment, in the same language, the Prophet said that on the Day of Judgment, a person would come that is huge and mighty in the sense of his tyranny and his arrogance and his pride. So physically could be huge and also have a really big head in the metaphorical sense and could see himself far greater than he actually is. And Allah puts him in the mizan. Allah puts him in the scale. Because on the day of judgment, not only are our deeds weighed, we ourselves are weighed. But we are weighed for our iman and our character. And this man who is very proud of himself, who was a man of pride, who commanded a certain presence or authority in this world or amount of wealth, is put in that scale and he does not weigh in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the wing of a mosquito. And so the dunya has no value to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nor does a person who's immersed themselves in this dunya have any value to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nor do the vessels that carry our souls have any value to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah does not look at your bodies or your appearances, but Allah looks at your hearts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at that which is internal. And that's what determines value in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so what gives us value as people is that which is not of this world. That which, has, that which existed before this world and that which will exist after this world. So the dunya and the people of dunya and the vessels of dunya are all worthless in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What makes it worth anything are the people that are beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that reside in a certain place. And so the first thing that we establish is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already has determined the value of this dunya to not be worth more than the weight of a mosquito. And Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala says, as for the believers, because of their knowledge of Allah and what Allah has informed them of the nature of this dunya, they also are not deluded by it. They also see no value in it. And so they decide to abandon this world in the spiritual sense before the world abandons them. That's a powerful message. Before the dunya has fooled you until the end of your life and deluded you, spiritually you're able to shut off those shackles, to break those shackles. There is not a single person except that at one point in their existence, they will completely shed the worth of this dunya, even the most wicked of disbelievers. Because on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that on the day of judgment, a, a person would be willing to present this world in gold to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to get themselves out of the situation that they're in in the hereafter. They have no love for this world whatsoever. They would be willing to abandon everything of this dunya to better themselves in the hereafter. And he said that's why it was called dunya. That's why it was called the most humiliated, because there's not a single creature except that that creature will abandon it at some point in their existence. The game is to figure it out before it's too late. But everyone at one point in their existence is going to say, it really wasn't worth it. It really wasn't worth it. Some people come to that realization in this world, but they come to it too late to actually do anything about it. So at some point, everyone comes to that realization. The problem is, is that usually that realization comes far too late, or it comes in a way that does not inspire productivity, but only hinders you further. So it comes to only serve you despair. And that's not the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to treat this world. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the Qur'an mentions dunya over and over and over again. The life of this world, the life of this world, the life of this world. Illustrating the nature of it, illustrating the way that we should treat it, illustrating the way that we should make use of it. Do not forget that which is in this dunya. Pursue the akhirah. Run towards the hereafter. Rush to prepare yourself in the hereafter. But at the same time, don't forget your position in this world, don't forget what's been presented to you. And basically the believer sees this dunya as an opportunity to elevate himself in his actual existence, to ele elevate himself in actual eternity. Now the problem becomes when we condition our belief 
with our success or failure or ease or hardship in this dunya. And that is the greatest spiritual disease that we have. And it seems very simple. SubhanAllah, it seems like a very simple equation. That don't equate hardship in this world with the hatred of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't equate test with punishment. And don't see ease as a sign of goodness so that you become comfortable and complacent. Meaning, the way that your status is in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has virtually nothing to do with how your status is in this world. It seems simple enough. You can talk hours and hours and hours about fitna and the reality of test and trial. But then when you're in that position, suddenly that which was theoretical becomes so difficult to practice. It was so easy when you were listening in the khutbah and it was so easy when you were telling that other person, hey, you'll get through this. This is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then it struck you hard and you went, whoa, ya Allah, I know I told that other person to have trust in you, but why are you doing this to me? And the reality is, is that in our greed, we're usually okay with the dunya being unfair as long as it's unfair in our favor. <laughs> Once it becomes unfair against us, then it becomes problematic. As long as it's unfair to six billion other people and the rest of the world is burning down and going to hell and all types of things are happening to them, it's okay as long as it's fair to me and I can come to terms with my slate. But once my slate turns on me, suddenly that which was theoretical becomes so difficult to practice. And you start looking to Allah and you say, why? Ya Allah, give me. And subhanAllah, Sahl ibn Sa'id narrates that the Prophet sallallahu says, if Allah loves you, if Allah loves you, he protects him from the dunya. Allah takes him away from the dunya. The way that if one of you had a fever or some sort of illness, that would be worsened by cold water. But you really, really want that cold water. But that cold water will increase you in sickness. And the doctor holds it back from you. Knowing that it's, go it's not good for your condition right now. But when you're in that pain, can you see outside of that pain? No, that pain is influencing your thought process, your spirituality, your perspective on life, your perspective on death. You're seeing everything through that lens of pain. And suddenly, all you want is, Ya Allah, get me out of this. Ya Allah, get me out of this pain. And Allah holds it back from you because He knows it's better for you. Be the statement, this world is not worth the wing of a mosquito to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reflects the Islamic view on the transient nature of worldly life compared to the eternal life of the hereafter. The material wo wealth, pleasures, and the status that people often chase in this world are insignificant in the sight of Allah because they are temporary. Everything in this world will eventually perish and the real value lies in what a person earns from the hereafter. This teaching reminds Muslims to focus on acts of worship, charity and moral conduct which will have lasting rewards in the next life. This hadith conveys a powerful lesson about perspective while humans may place great importance on worldly possessions and achievements. In the grand scope of Allah's creation, the world holds little value. A mosquito's wing is one of the smallest, most insignificant things imaginable, yet this analogy emphasizes that even the most extravagant parts of this world are of lesser worth to Allah. Therefore, Muslims are encouraged not to become overly attached to this life and its destructions, but to keep their eyes on the ultimate goal of earning Allah's pleasure and securing a place in Jannah. In essence, this teaching is a call to prioritize spirituality over materialism. It helps Muslims develop a sense of detachment from worldly desires and a deeper connection to Allah. The real worth lies in righteous deeds and the pursuit of piety. By reminding themselves of the insignificance of the world, Muslims are able to live with greater humility, gratitude and purpose aiming for a higher eternal reward in the hereafter.